figure out who it is. So hey, so I'm going to talk about um, engines and programming and VR performance. So for me, um, what I do all day is I make engines, and I make engines run better. Um, so I don't actually develop games, but I uh, you know, develop the tech that allows me to make games. So previously I did this at Oculus. I built custom engines that were especially performing in VR, and then before that worked at Unity, building their graphics engines and the tech that a lot of you guys are using today. And then um, before that, I worked in art installations and building custom engines for that. Um, and currently I'm uh, running Binomial, which is a company that focuses on engine development and helping people make their engines faster. And as a part of that, we're building a texture compressor that um, fits into engines and makes them run even better. Yep. So why do I care? I started out interested in building digital art and um, I was really interested in, uh, I worked for a company where we built really in innovative art installations with like lots of monitors, lots of uh, unique um, interactions, different devices talking to each other and we often found that we couldn't use Unity. We couldn't use Unreal. We were doing stuff that it wasn't made to do. And what that meant was we had to start building our own tech. And I, I feel really passionately that um, engines shouldn't be a black box. They're our tool. And we shouldn't be too defined by it. If it doesn't fit our needs, we should build something else. you know. And we should be able to get creative with that. So um, I'm just going to give you a high, high level um, overview of how engines work to hopefully make them seem less scary, <laughs> um, specifically focus on graphics performance. And then after that, talk about some ideas for optimization and maybe even building your own engines, which is super cool. So how do graphics specifically work in a game engine? Well, everything starts on the CPU. You have a CPU and a GPU in computers. And a lot of processes happen on the CPU. The GPU is meant for graphics processing. So the CPU sets up everything you need. It says, here's where the camera is, here's where all my mesh data is, and then it sends it to the GPU and says, go render that. So <laughs> basically, we've sent all our data to the GPU. Now that's where our rendering takes place. It starts with all this data, and at the end, you end up with a flat 2D image that constitutes your frame. And that's all it is. It's like just flashing 2D images in front of your face. And it's really important to keep that at 90 frames per second or higher in VR, or else people will throw up. And that's not, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> so shaders are really fun. And I think shaders are actually a really cool um, introduction point to engine programming and graphics programming. Um, so the cool thing about shaders is, remember I said everything starts on the CPU and gets sent to the GPU? That's a bottleneck. Often your GPU is in a completely different place in your computer and you have to send all this data to it. With shaders, you get to program code that executes on the GPU itself. That's nice. That's really cool in terms of performance. So there's different kinds of shaders that basically plug themselves in to different parts of the graphics pipeline. You start with mesh points and you end up with a 2D Vertex shaders happen when you're still at the mesh point stage. So what can you do with a vertex shader? You can like sniff fluid simulation in there and you know make them your meshes move in cool ways. You can do all kinds of really interesting things. Particle effects are another cool one. I think fragment shaders are even cooler. Fragment shaders allow you to work with pixels. So that's how a lot of lighting works in engines, is they take um, the uh, pixels on a texture or on screen space itself, and they're able to alter it. So we can, you know, say, turn all white areas blue, or make a blur effect if we do multiple passes, or all kinds of really cool things. I love fragment shaders. Uh, one really cool thing about fragment shaders, too, is that they're super parallel. So think about that. All shaders are, tend to be very parallel on the GPU. So you have each pixel executing this code that you write, at the same time. So that can make it really, really fast. If you have a simulation, like particle simulations or something, that don't need to know about where all the other particles are, you can just have them all run the code at the same time and it's so much faster than you would get on a CPU, which isn't as parallel, which I, I think is amazing. <laughs> so more things on shaders. Um, so that's kind of what I was talking about, about the different things that you can do with uh, fragment shaders. One of the coolest things, I think, is that there are a few um, innovative engines that do most of the stuff in the fragment shader. So what they do is their, um, their scene is just a square. It's just a quad that takes up the whole screen. And in the fragment shader, they render the whole scene. So they can store that in voxels. They can store that in different kinds of data that represents the scene. And they basically like 
rain march or use different techniques to make everything happen in a fragment shader. It's a little more advanced, but I thought that was really cool. So different ways that you can optimize engines, knowing the basics of how they work. Uh, well, first, why, are, why is that even important? As I said, it's really important that you hit 90 frames a second. And I think the other thing about it is if you don't hit 90 frames a second, if you're, if you're running slower, well, you could do other things, like you could just cut the amount of geometry in your scene, you could design a different experience, you could work around that, but why? Like, why limit yourself? As I said, this is your tool, and why not try to make your tool better instead of redesigning around optimization all the time? So there's a lot of, I mean, and the more you read about this, the more you'll see room for optimizations. Like, as I said, if you set up the data on the CPU and send it to the GPU, um, are you sending too much data? Can we cut, can we reuse data? Can we maybe not have as many meshes in the scene? Are the shaders we're using too complex? They're efficient, but you can do too many operations in them too. And in an engine, this often means going to quality settings and seeing like, what do I not need? Like, do I not need the super fancy global illumination lighting? Do I, do I not need like really crisp or really beautifully made shadows like and turning them off where needed? And also, this is really important, consider whether you're on mobile or embedded devices or desktop. Gear VR is mobile, um, Vive and Oculus Rift are desktop. And that, I mean, the, the optimization differences between the two are so, so vast. I often recommend that people just treat them dif completely differently and don't try to make too much of a unifying experience. Um, one little advanced note is multi-threading is super awesome. And there's actually, this is a very, hot topic right now in engines and um, how we can use it better, especially in VR. You know, for instance, um, the data typically is processed and whenever you're finished processing your data, like your physics calculations or whatever, you uh, render a frame. Well, what if that takes so long that you can't hit 90 FPS like that? Maybe you can do those calculations on a separate thread and, you know, render it even if it's not done. So um, considering multi-threading and considering how to make your uh, applications more important, uh, more efficient is really important. So we can get creative here too. So as I said, there's a lot of room for innovation. Um, I talked about a lot of those uh, different ways to represent scenes is really cool. Uh, the um, engine I worked on at Oculus, for instance, was represented entirely with voxels. There was no meshes. There was no setting up vertices and triangles. It was just a grid of 3D data that we pass to the GPU. So you could do that in all kinds of different ways. Um, I think it's really fascinating to take a uh, look at um, how the GPU is really highly parallel, like I said, with pic uh, pixel shaders, and uh, how can we use that to make our engines faster. So I really encourage everyone to feel inspired. Like, don't just see engines as this black box that <laughs> you know you, you, you have to use and they are what they are. You can build your own. Like, what I do right now mostly is building custom engines for people because the VR is so new and the engines we have now could be a lot better. Um, so we should make them better and it's really not that hard and it's really exciting. Uh, so there's lots of engines out there. I listed a ton. I'm, I have a soft spot for free and open source engines because that's how I learned engine programming. So Cinder and Open Frameworks are both really good for that and they have some VR forks, which is really cool. And then I left some uh, resources here. I'll post the slides on Twitter or something. Uh, there's one that's really good for a uh, basic intro and then one if you want to dive into the deep end <laughs> and really get into the stuff in detail. And then that's all. So thanks. questions, let me know. Um, yeah. Um, so I know that a really big issue in VR is convergence artifacts. Um, I remember those are often caused by uh, shaders in particular mapping. Is there anything that you do in general to avoid those problems in VR? Ah, uh, yeah. There's a, I mean, there's actually, artifacts are a really big deal in VR and making, and of many different kinds. So um, one, and also just best practices that worked on regular uh, PC games won't work so well in VR. Uh, making sure that you're really aware of not doing screen space um, operations is really important. 
because in VR, what is screen space? It's like, <laughs> it's, it's all around you and very distorted. Um, and also being very well aware of uh, things like having super good anti-aliasing is very important um, because in real life you don't have jaggies everywhere and making sure that uh, your compression is good quality and things like that. There's lots, there's lots there. <laughs> I mean, they support um, multi-threading, and they're starting to add it into their engines, but it could be a lot better. Um, and oh, I, I probably shouldn't mention the engines by name, but there are a lot of engines that could be a lot better with multi-threading. And um, there's some, like, for instance, Max Play specifically focuses on how it's great with multi-threading, and that's like an advantage to using it. Um, so it's good to be aware of that and ask that question of the engine you use. Like, how do you use that? How is your architecture designed? Is it good for VR? Um, I think it's a, a lot of these optimizations haven't been in there because they haven't needed to. Like, 30 to 45 FPS is good enough for a while, so now it's not. Now you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Valve is kind of pushing the envelope with uh, graphics optimization to try to get the, the specs, the minimum specs for all the VR headsets lower so that there are more consumer grade graphics cards that can actually run the headsets. Yes. Do you have any hypothesis about what the limitations about that kind of optimization work can do? Yeah, I um, and Oculus has done a little bit of that too, just like making sure the VR platforms themselves can say, okay, if your game can't hit 90 for whatever reason, we'll like add frames in there or make it so that you can do 90. I think that kind of stuff will actually help Nausea a lot, but I think that it's still really important, even if you're getting the 90 frames, you want updates. Like it doesn't feel good to not have it running sm perfectly smoothly. Um, and I, I don't think that will fix that problem as much, but at least people won't be throwing up as often. <laughs> 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 